Hello everyone, welcome to the soluble, soluble mediators of the immune system to include the complement system. We've talked about the complement system a couple times in the last few weeks. Um, haven't gotten into, gone into any detail on it yet, but here's where we get to memorize the fun cascade that you've um, been waiting for called complement. First, we're going to do a little review because you just need to know what these things are. What is CRP? CRP is C-reactive protein. It is increased in generalized inflammation. So whether you get in a bad car accident, whether you have a heart attack, whether you hit your knee on the corner of the um, wall when you're walking out of the room or your big toe, you're going to have some C-reactive protein released from having that inflammation. It is not specific. Um, it is not uh, a good indicator or something to use to diagnose somebody, but it is a good thing to use when we're monitoring inflammation to see if the inflammation has decreased over a period of treatment. Something that's produced by the liver, we call it an acute phase reactant. Okay, let's move on to the complement system. Complement is a defense in the natural immune system. Once we have are exposed to a foreign organism, and our antibodies start getting ramped up, they attach and then complement comes in to finish the job, okay? So these are the whole process that has to happen in order to destroy or bust a hole in the side of the uh, bacterium or whatever it may be that's entering the body. So we find that complement, um, it can be increased in inflammatory conditions, having an acute illness or sickness, and in trauma situations as well. We do see complement levels decreased when there has been excessive activation or use. Sometimes there's a defect causing an absent or altered um, level. Um, we can have immune complexing diseases happen. Um, having rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, glomerular nephritis, infectious diseases, and control protein deficiency. Um, just a little review here I have on the side. What is opsonization? We t you guys had that um, on a t take home quiz and things like that a couple week or last week. Um, just so you know, that is what I refer to as coating the bacterium with C3B molecules to make it extra tasty. So it's better, easier for phagocytosis to occur if those things are present on the surface of the bacteria. So, what is complement? It consists of 18 plasma proteins that are synthesized in the liver. They're heat label. And there are three pathways to which complement can begin. The classical pathway, the alternative pathway, and a mannose binding lectin pathway. I'm going to run you through each of the three of those today. So how do each of these things start? Well, each pathway starts in a different way. Um, first, there are control proteins involved. We're not going to go into a lot of detail on those, but we have C1 inhibitor protein, factor 1, factor H, C4 binding protein. Those present to inhibit uncontrolled complement activation. Obviously, once complement gets started, you don't want it to just go completely crazy. You have to have something to be able to slow it down. All right, so let's talk about the three pathways. The first one, the classical pathway, is started by an antigen forming a complex with an antibody, which is what we've been studying the last couple of weeks. So if a foreign bacterial cell enters the body, it will combine with either two molecules of IgG or one IgM. This is initiated by the bonding of the C1 complex consisting of C1Q, C1R, and C1S. It amplifies the effects of humoral immunity as well. So what you really need to know, classical pathway starts by antigen antibody complex. The next one is the alternative pathway. This is activated by contact with a foreign surface, such as a polysaccharide coating of a microorganism, and the covalent bonding of a small amount of C3B to hydroxyl groups on a cell surface. I know that's a big mouthful. In essence, what this means is that the alternate pathway can just be started with the contact of a foreign surface. It doesn't have to have an antibody combined to it. Okay, the next one was the mannose binding lectin. We'll get to that more in a little bit later. Let's talk a little bit about the complement receptors. Here's what you need to know about each of these. The function of the receptors is dependent upon the type of cell that has them. A C1R enhances phagocytosis and it's the only receptor on RBCs. 
CR2 affects lymphocytes in their response to antigen stimulation, and CR3 plays a role in host defense mechanisms such as phagocytosis. Some of the effects of complement activation after complement has been started, we see blood vessel dilation, increased vascular permeability, we see cellular activation or the production of inflammatory mediators, sometimes hemolysis, and then we have that opsonization, which leads the cell very vulnerable to phagocytosis. I say it's like putting A1 steak sauce on the steak. It just makes it extra tasty. All right, so we're going to go through the classic pathway first, and then we'll go through the alternative and then the mannose-binding lectin. The major effector mechanism for antibody-mediated immunity is this classic pathway. We have components C1 through C9 that are not in order. It goes C1, then 4, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. C3 is, the, is in the largest amount in the plasma, and it's a major quantitative reaction of the complement cascade. So he is a big player. The majority of complement components are made in the hepatic parenchymal cells um, in the liver. So there's three stages. First one is recognition. Then we have enzyme activation, and then the membrane attack leading to cell destruction. So we're going to run through this whole thing. I know it's going to be a little overwhelming for you. This isn't going to be the last time you go over it. You're going to spend your whole lab, week five, going over this whole process. Okay? So it begins with the fixation of the C1 complex, which is C1Q, C1R, and C1S. This converts C3. C1 fixation occurs when C1Q binds directly to the antibody or immunoglobulin. Just keep in mind, C1Q is known as a recognition unit. C1R and C1S do not bind the immunoglobulin, but are involved in the activation of the classic pathway. C1S then activates C4 and C2. The fixation of this depends on the subclass of immunoglobulin. Only certain subclasses can fix C1. And with spatial constraints, especially IgM is so big, it can fix C1, but at least two immunoglobulins are needed to fix C1. The amount of C1 fixed is directly proportional to the concentration of IgM antibodies. However, this is not true for IgG, because obviously it's smaller. The next step is enzymatic activation. So now the activated C1S is responsible for the cleavage of the next two involved comp complement components, C4 and C2. Next, C4, which is also a viral neutralizer, is cleaved into two fragments, C4B and C4A. The larger C4B molecule attaches to the target membrane nearby, while C4A acts as an anaphylatoxin and floats away to go get more help, essentially. Kind of goes out there and says, hey, we got problems here. An exposed site on the C4B is available to interact with the next complement component, C2. Activated C1 cleaves the C2 into two pieces, C2A and C2B. In this case, C2A stays, C2B floats away. What remains bound to the membrane is that C4B and the C2A molecules. We call this C4B2A, also known as the C3 convertase. It's called this because its role is to convert the next complement component, C3, into an active form. C4B, C2A is known as the activation unit, also C3 convertase. It can be called either one. So then the complement cascade reaches its full amplitude at C3. C3 converts, um, convertase activates C3 by splitting the peptide into C3A and C3B. C3A floats away, which has a role in inducing the inflammatory response. It also helps release histamine and things from basophils. But C3B remains as a major residual split portion. It binds to the C4B2A to form C4B2A3B, which is known as the C5 convertase. Remember that C3B also plays a role in opsonization. I do have a video that you're going to watch many times that's going to show this whole process happening. C5 convertase act activates C5 by splitting the peptide into C5A and C5B. C5A floats away, which contributes to inflammation and potent chemotactic activity, but C5B binds to the antigen surface. This binding of C5 is the initial step in the formation of the MAC attack or membrane attack complex. 
The membrane-bound complement component, C5B, is bound by the next complement molecule, C6. The resulting biomolecular, biomolecular complex next binds C7 and C8. The C5 B through 8 complex acts as a receptor for C9. What happens in the end is that whole grouping C5 through C9 creates a hole in the membrane and causes the lysis of the cell and everything to come out. So therefore the cell collapses and dies. Okay, that was a lot. Now what I recommend you do is go back when you have the whole cascade sitting in front of you and listen to my lecture again, looking at that whole um, cascade. So you can kind of follow it along. It'll make a lot more sense. So the next one is the alternate pathway. Microbial and other cell surfaces will activate this. Um, like the classical pathway, the alternative pathway produces a C5, 3 and C5 convertase, which leads to the production of the MAC attacks. So the MAC attacks the same on the end. However, the first three proteins, C1, 4, and 2, aren't part of the cascade sequence as they are in the classical one. Complement component C3 is spontaneously cleaved at low levels. This means that there are C3A and C3B fragments freely floating in the serum. The C3B component can attach to a number of different surfaces, both foreign and host cells. C3B is quickly inactivated by sialic acid found in mammalian cell surfaces, which is nice because if your body was coating its own cells with C3B, it would be eating itself. We don't want that. So, um, so we have sialic acid on our you know, cell surfaces, so it shouldn't destroy ours. Microbes, which lack sialic acid, are very stable sites for that C3B, making them extra tasty for phagocytosis. The next path, part of the alternative pathway is the C3 convertase. Membrane-bound C3B fragments are bound by factor B, which is in turn cleaved by factor D. So we didn't have the factor D last time, or factor B. Fragment big B little a floats away, while big B little b stays associated with C3B. What we have next is C3 little b big B little b, which is known as C3 convertase. The C3 convertase of the alternative pathway is not very stable. So we have something called propyridin, which helps stabilize this complex. The alternative pathway C3 convertase acts just like the classical pathway enzyme of the same name and cleaves hundreds of C3 molecules into a C3A and C3B. The C3B molecule remains attached to the alternative path pathway C5 convertase which is C3 little b big b little b 3b. Now these get kind of hard to uh, memorize, but you're just going to have to go ahead, use your study blue flashcards and do what you can. This enzyme converts C5 into C5A and C5B. The C5B molecule remains associated with the membrane and associates with C6 through C9 to form MAC or the final destruction. As you can see, I do have some YouTube videos and other videos embedded throughout these PowerPoints. I encourage you to go back and um, watch these processes. So the classical versus the alternative pathways, know the differences between not only how they're initiated, we talked about that, but the difference between the C3 and C5 convertases of the two. The last one I talked about briefly in the beginning were the mannose binding lectin pathway. This pathway uses a protein similar to C1Q of the classical um, complement pathway, which binds to mannose residues and other sugars. But it forms a complex with MASP1 and MASP2. MASP stands for mannose binding lectin associated serine proteases. MASP1 and MASP2 are very similar to C1R and C1S of the, comp of the classical component. But when mannose binding lectin bind onto a pathogen, MASP1 and MASP2 are activated to cleave component C4 and C2 into C4A, C4B, C2A, and C2B. C4B and C2A combine on the surface of the pathogen to form C3 convertase. The rest of it proceeds just like a class, the classical pathway does. So in general, the function of the complement proteins is to lyse the cell by the membrane attack complex. The biologic effects of the fragments of complement play a role in immunity and inflammation. Again, we talked about this in the beginning, but this is very important. We see elevated complement levels in things like inflammatory conditions, trauma, <coughs> acute
acute illness, it's common and not specific. We can't just say, hey, you've got elevated C3, you have um, lupus. You can't do that. You need to go for, do some further testing to find out why. Decreased complement levels can be caused if it has been excessively activated recently, it's currently being consumed, or if there's a genetic defect present. Our last slide is a little bit of a review of what the cytokines are. They are made and secreted by the cells associated with the innate and adaptive immunity in response to microbial and other antigen exposure. So the first one, interleukins, mediate interactions between leukocytes but do not bind an antigen. The lymphokine is a soluble mediator produced by lymphocytes. Chemokines stimulate leukocyte migration from blood to tissue. Interferons are discovered in virally infected cells, act as antiviral agents. Um, and tumor necrosis factor is a principal mediator of acute inflammatory response to gram-negative bacteria and other types of infectious microbes. But large amounts of it can cause septic shock. That concludes our section on the complement system. I really suggest going back, watching it again with the complement cascade in front of you so you can follow along.